trust that God's favor is still resting on you. Tonight we want to continue on in our teaching on the straight gate. Um, we've been looking at Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 to 14. The scripture says it, says it quite clearly. Jesus said, All right, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. It's, it's the King James Version I'm speaking from, but it's saying that a multitude will follow the wide gate or the broad way. The scripture's clear. It talks about leading or being led away into destruction or perdition. Because straight is the gate, verse 14, and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. And so this is Jesus speaking. And I just want to say this, that it's not something that he's hoping it will change. He's made a statement of what will happen. So we need to know that we're going to be walking in the narrow way, that we're walking in the straight gate. That straight gate or the narrow way has many different patterns. It has many different descriptions, but we can say very confidently that it's speaking about the day of atonement, which is the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, the day of his return unto a perfect day. All of those descriptions about the day is pointing only to one day. And that one day is the day of atonement. And I might also say that talking about one day, there's only ever been one covenant, there's only been one purpose, and that was that the Father desires to have sons. Sons that carry his character that he, the Father, might express himself through that character to express himself through to do what he desires to do. That's a true son. A son has a character that without thinking twice, he moves in obedience to what the Father's desire is. Whatever the Father's will is, the son will do it. Right? And so in order that we come into this, this straight gate, we need to know that there is, a, there is such a thing. Not only is there such a straight gate and a narrow way, what's more important is that we understand the timing of it. And the time is here. The time is here now. Because in times past, we've seen the other two major feasts and the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the third major feast, but the first two feasts are the Feast of Passover. And generally we can say that the Feast of Passover is talking about being born again. The second major feast is the Feast of Pentecost, which also generally speaks about being baptized in the Spirit, speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit beginning to flow, empowering us in our walk in Christ. All of that is true and is important. And for many of you that are watching uh, this uh, telecast or you're watching this uh, this setup you would have experienced probably those two major feasts already you're born again you've been baptized in water you're filled with the Holy Spirit you speak in tongues you're baptized in the Spirit so your experience has been Passover and Pentecost but God's purpose has not yet happened it's on its way and there's a progressive revelation that's leading us into this last and final feast, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you speak in baptism, it's the baptism of fire. But let me say this, that Jesus made it very clear. He said, unless you're born of water, that's Passover, and of the Spirit, that's Pentecost, you cannot enter or become one with the kingdom of God. So he is saying just by that phrase that the Feast of Tabernacles is actually the kingdom of God. So that tells me that Passover and Pentecost is the church age. Now we're stepping into the kingdom age, which is the, the age of change, or should I say the completion of the eternal covenant, the completion of this one purpose, and that was to have, to have sons. And without getting too heavy into this instructions, because I want to speak about uh, part of what Jesus did when he 
died on the cross and he, he bled seven times. There's seven places in his own body that he died. I uh, should I say uh, shed blood. But I want to read the scripture here talking about this area of the one, the one eternal covenant, the one purpose, which is to be a son. That hasn't changed. There's one testimony. There's only one word. There's only one faith. And it makes it more simple to follow the leading of the Lord now. Because in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, 12, and 13, he says, and you know the scripture well, he says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, right? And some pastors and teachers to do this, three things, for the perfecting of the saints or the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, right? For the edifying of the body of Christ. So those things we know of, those things we have experienced, much of our life as Christians, we have been equipped for our earthly ministry, for the work of the ministry. That's our earthly ministry. We're not talking about it. In fact, it has a, a, an eternal uh, benefit and a, an eternal consequence. But by and large, it's centered around the earth. So for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Then it says this in verse 13, until... That happens until we come into the unity of the faith. Now, the word unity in the Greek is oneness. So this is coming us, this is coming back to the one covenant, the one purpose, the one testimony, the one reason God created all this is that we have a oneness in faith. That faith is that eternal covenant. That faith has always been what was in his heart. He said, until we come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Right? I just wanted to point out by using that scripture there to say that if we're coming into the Feast of Tabernacles, which is bringing us into perfection, right? God has breathed into this feast the revelation of, for perfection, the revelation to strip us of the flesh, to deal with these areas. And if we're going to the straight gate or going through the straight gate, right, that's in God or the narrow way, that journey is a journey of separation of the flesh. It means it's a day of atonement. It means to go through there, I have to realize my head is going to be removed. That is, that is that it, there's the beheading that I need to know about and be prepared for. Now, let me say that it's not a personal uh, or a physical beheading like I've been taught when I was growing up and everyone was <laughs> quite in fear of the, the end times because Armageddon and everything else was talking about coming into a place where we're going to have our physical heads removed. They made movies about it. Our heads were going to fall in this basket and so many things and there was fear everywhere. It's supposed to be a time of celebration to go through a feast that was going to deal with the law of sin and the law of death. This is the true full circumcision in the spirit. When I have my head removed, I have the nature and character of the flesh removed that's full circumcision to have the head removed and so i get excited about it because we're stepping into this now i've said that because we need to know that the straight gate is the day of atonement I, i've said this on a number of occasions and i need to say it again that when we talk about eschatology which means a study of end times or end things it's all relegated, the understanding of it is all relegated to the Feast of Tabernacles. It is not for the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost and Passover have their boundaries, if you like, and their limitations of blessings and its benefits. But God never said anything within the Feast of Passover or the Feast of Pentecost that has anything to do with instructing us by revelation, instructing us in the steps in which we are to walk, that we can find our way in the end times or to find the purpose 
of how and when and where he's going to return. It's all relegated to the Feast of Tabernacles. And if we don't make the change and come through the Feast of Trumpets, and according to uh, Numbers chapter 10 and verse 10, prophetically it says that they blew the trumpet over the sacrifice. What does that, what does that prophetically mean? It means that the Feast of Trumpets is a prophetic word that when it's spoken, it unveils the substance of the Day of Atonement. It unveils the reality of the Day of Atonement. We are not going to go back and reenact the Feast of Tabernacles. We're not going to go back and sit up on the roof in some Jewish roof and sit under the booths and, and start to reenact all that sort of stuff and put on the, the priestly skirts and everything. We're not going to do that. It's all symbolic of a prophetic reality, of a substance, of a character that's inside of us. So the Feast of Tabernacles has to be understood that there is the Feast of Trumpets that will unveil the substance of the Day of Atonement. This is all Jesus in him. And then eventually the Feast of Tabernacles proper itself, which means my physical body will benefit from the change once I go through this process. Mm -hmm. So let me say it again. If you're standing over here in Pentecost and you can speak in tongues, you've been baptized in water and baptized in tongues, I've said this before, it doesn't matter how many times you speak in tongues, in that language was not given to you for transformation. Not making light. I'm not making light of speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit. That is for a season in the church. But everyone, every feast of the Passover and Pentecost was to lead us on into this one feast, this last feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, to bring us into our perfection in Him for this reason, that we might become a son. So I said that before. It doesn't matter if you stand up and speak in tongues for a thousand years. It doesn't have the power to change and transform, and transform you. It will bless you and it will stir your heart. In fact, let me say this. If you dare to speak in tongues, all right? Give yourself eight hours a day speaking in tongues. You know what will come up in your heart? Move to tabernacles. That's what it'll say. Go across to the Feast of Trumpets. That's what you will hear because that's where the Holy Spirit is standing. You cannot negotiate with the Holy Spirit for him to change you during the Feast of Pentecost because it's not going to happen. God has already relegated everything of change and the end times and eschatology sits within the boundaries of the Feast of Tabernacles. So if you don't make the, the, the turn or the decision to go across, then there's no change. What does Zechariah 14 says? Come up to Jerusalem and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That's what we've got to do. Now, it would do your soul well if you started to study these three feasts, especially the substance of these three feasts. And I suppose the reason why we speak strong on it is because the Lord has told us and has given us a road map back into his presence. Amen? So I think this is something that God has been working on with us and for us. And now, we're, now that it's here, we need to walk strongly with what the Lord is saying. So on the, behind me here, I've just got written this up, that if you stay in Pentecost and you try to interpret the things of the Spirit in eschatology, as I said, because the language belongs to the Feast of Trumpets, you will only start to come up with decisions and what you would call some awareness, and you'll interpret the word as being external. You'll, you will push everything out to the outer. You will always say and interpret things in the word, whether it's in the book of Revelation or any other part, when you talk about eschatology, you will come up with the decision that it sits outside of you. Well, let me say this. When you were born again, it happened inside you. When you spoke in tongues, it happened inside of you. Guess what? His return is going to happen inside of you. It's not external coming in. He's already in. He's coming out. That's what this word is teaching. Jesus said it when at the, at the festival of water. He said, out of, out of your belly. That word belly is womb. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Thus he spoke of the spirit. So the spirit of resurrection is already in you. And I've said this for years. It's not outside of us. 
the entire package of your deliverance and your transformation is inside of you. We need to be spending more time looking into the Word and having the Word examine our own hearts. Looking into the Word and the mirror of His Word, knowing that the laws of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus that's in me is going to set me free from the law of sin and death that's in my soul. That's this whole purpose of what He's doing. And so when we talk about wars and rumors of wars, look inside because that's what he's talking about. The flesh is warring against the spirit. Doesn't matter what scripture you look in the book of Revelation, it has a tie that begins with inside of you. The church is inside of you. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I'm just laying a foundation here that to understand that if we're going to know in our hearts the revelation of his return, the revelation of eschatology end times, it's all on this side of the Feast of Tabernacles, You've got to be baptized in this Feast of Trumpets. That means to have eyes to see, ears to hear about the Day of Atonement that sits inside of you. Your deliverance is already within you. It's in your spirit. But God is going to minister that by His Spirit if you submit to what He's saying. So, let me just move on and speak a little bit about the blood of Jesus and the fact that Jesus bled seven times this walk from the garden of Gethsemane to the garden tomb is the straight gate the narrow way it's the day of atonement and we need to know that because he walked that way he carried me with him it's imputed to me amen and there's so many scriptures that talk about this testimony which means a witness it means it's accounted to you for righteousness. It also means that it's imputed to me. It means what Jesus did, I can identify with him that I was with him. That what he did, I received the benefits of it. And that is given to me by revelation. When I get a revelation of the Day of Atonement that Jesus walked this road, then in the mind of God, it's authentic and it's factual and it's true, it's contributed and imputed to me, to my account that I walked it. That's another subject on the law of identification, which is oneness. But right here, right now, I want us to understand that this straight gate, narrow way is a highway of the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Christ. And I've gave some scriptures to you last time. If you go back on my earlier recordings, you'll see they were speaking about a highway shall be there, and it's a way of holiness. Isaiah 35, 8 to 10. Isaiah 11, 16 speaks about a highway for the remnant of his people. Psalm 16, 11, Thou shalt show me the path of life. Proverbs 12, 28. The way of righteousness, the path, a path there is no death. Hallelujah. There's death to flesh, but there is life to my spirit. So seven times Jesus bled in the garden, and I'll just quickly say what they are. The Bible says in Luke 22, 44, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. The second time he bled was by the stripes that were on his back. He was scourged, he was whipped. And the scripture is very clear that it's for our healing. The third time, the scripture says that the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. That's an interesting study. We won't get, that to, get to that tonight. <laughs> we will at another time. But the fourth time was when he was crucified. Nails in the right hand. They mean something. Let me, let me say that, that when, Jesus, when Jesus was born, the eternal covenant was put in him. Because I said the word... And remember, there's only one eternal covenant, one purpose, and it was in that one word. The eternal covenant was in Christ. So when Jesus was born, he was born with the eternal covenant in him. It says, it says, in the beginning was the word. Then it says, in the word, verse 14, in John 1, the word was made flesh and dwell among us. And we talked about that a little bit. But I wanted to say that clearly because he earthed all of what was spoken by the Father, which gives us legal access and real, real access 
to the eternal covenant, which means the transfer of sonship is given to us. Now, when Adam was created, he had the same opportunity. But because he sinned, and we know the story, because he sinned, he fell, many say he fell from grace. Well, he fell from grace, but through Christ, Jesus put him back into grace, put us back into grace. The Bible says that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But also, probably more accurate, Adam fell from sonship. Now Jesus has come and he has brought us back to that place of sonship. In every reality and detail and substance and truth of what that means, it has been given to us through what Christ did. So when I speak about Jesus being uh, or bleeding seven times, it was because in him was the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. In him was the eternal covenant. But to have it transferred to us and to earth it where we are and to redeem us, he had to bleed. And I, I, there are other words I want to say about the bleeding, but it was sacrificial. It was redemptive. There is a remission because of his blood. We're justified. We're forgiven. Peter calls it his precious blood. All of those words, and I don't want to lighten the value of the word by saying that it's generic. All I'm saying is that from Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, the blood is all the way through. But here we need to understand clearly that this straight gate, this narrow way, and how Jesus bled during the Day of Atonement has far more impact on our change and our transformation than just being born again and speaking in tongues. This is going to bring it home for us. This Feast of the Day of Atonement was always the one day, the only day for transformation, right? It's the purpose of God being now fulfilled in a company of people that can stand up and say we truly are sons because of what Christ did. And it has to come through the times of his bleeding or the way in which he bled. So he made a point of it. The first time he bled was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I don't want to spend too much time except to pick up on saying that he sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when we have a, a close look at what that would mean, the scripture is very clear that he sweat fell into the ground. And the Bible says in Genesis, Chapter 3 and 17, it says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. He says, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, that's the curse, that's the revealing of the curse that's coming through, it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field, then he says, in the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread. And I made note that to eat bread, prophetically, not only in the natural, but in the spirit, to eat means to believe and receive bread. Of course, in the spirit is a word. Jesus said on a number of occasions, be weary of the leaven of the Pharisees. Be weary of the leaven of Herod. He was speaking about the words and the spirit of their words were from the world and from the religious system. He said, be aware of the bread or, the, or the, uh, the, the, be aware of the, the leaven of the Pharisees, which he's talking about the bread. So the point I'm making here is that when God said, right, that you will eat of the bread, he's saying you will eat your own carnal, soulish words. There is no prophetic life in your soul. It is full of death. He goes on to say, and you will eat that until you return to the ground. That word ground is the same as dust. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And I try to make that point strong, because Ecclesiastes 3.20 says the same thing. All go under one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to the dust again. But you see, because in the Day of Atonement, 
We're looking at a new chapter in our life and an opportunity that through Christ, he's broken the curse. The blood has hit the dust and it has turned dust. Now I have life. Mm -hmm. So now I can speak from my spirit that's alive and eat the words of the spirit and not eat the words of my own soul, which have no prophetic understanding in it at all. So my point in saying that, while I speak in tongues and I, and I receive the revelation of the Holy Spirit concerning these two feasts, Passover and Pentecost, when I receive the blessings of the revelation of these two feasts, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with revelation from the Holy Spirit of Passover. We still need to, be get, we still need to get people saved. And also, the words from Pentecost, they are a blessing. But the moment you try to use this language to interpret another feast which has its own language, you're out of order. And when you're out of order, the Spirit of God will not reveal to you because you're still sitting in another feast and you haven't made the transition across by faith to hear what God is saying and how is he saying it. Now, if you're interested in eschatology and you know nothing about the Feast of Trumpets, then you need to make the move. If you don't, and you still have an interest in that, and you try to speak in tongues or read the word, and you're still sitting here, I'm saying to you on the authority of God's word, you will end up speaking out of your own soul, prophesying out of your own soul, hearing things of the soul concerning eschatology that was relegated only to this feast, and because of that, you will only hear what comes out of your own soul. Right there is the voice of the beast. Right there is the false prophets and the voice of the dragon. It will come out of you because you've not moved across to how God has set it up. And you've got to move across. It's, I can't stress that enough. Otherwise, you'll still be eating the dust out of your own soul. And that'll take you back to death. Uh-huh. So, but because Jesus sweat great drops of blood and hit the ground, amen. I can now say, as I said before, I will not die. I will not see corruption. And I will not return to the dust. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? I can understand that, that statement now. Because death has been swallowed up of life. Amen. I have a new DNA, people. I have a new DNA. What's in my spirit is about to descend into the core of my soul and remove the law of sin and death out of my soul. The man of sin is going to be removed by a word that's going to consume him in order for this change and this resurrection. All right, so a lot of stuff can be said about the first time that Jesus, Jesus bled. The second time that he bled, and I suppose this is what we want to look at a little bit tonight, is that... They whipped him. They scourged him. It says, the, the scripture reference is in John 19, verse 1. It says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Which means to hit him with, with whips. They whipped him. And there's a lot of teaching on around about that. The promise of that is in Isaiah 53, 51. By his stripes we are healed. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. It says, by whose stripes you were healed. So when we go back to Passover and Pentecost, you know, you know that you've been healed in your body. We know that. But I'm saying that in the day of atonement, there's coming a healing. There's coming a, a touch of God that when you step into the straight gate, it's impossible for you to get sick. It's impossible for you to stay the way you are because that stuff is going to drop off you. That's what I'm seeing in the word. So when Jesus said in John 11:4, he says that this sickness is not under death. Or he even said that this sickness, death will not be the end of it. In fact, death itself will be removed. That's why he stood up and he said in that same passage about Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And I pointed out, or well, last time I spoke, was that why would Jesus say, I am the resurrection, when he himself had not yet experienced death? And I made the point, if you can focus over here a little bit, I hope we can get that caught on the camera. But this is the outer circle of life, 
and we all go through the natural in our timeline. And by the way, the timeline is not lineal. It's not going that way. It's in a cycle. Everything in life is in a cycle, even our time frame in God. And in the natural, it's in a cycle. We've come out of the garden, and now we're on this cycle. But in the middle here, this is where Jesus was speaking from. He was speaking from the position of the I am. This is the bosom. This is in the spirit. And when you're in the spirit, you can look here and you can see Adam. And you can look here and you can see Abraham. Right? And you can look here and you can see Jesus. Right? And you can even see when he, was, when he died. You can even look to see where we are in 2020. Right? When you go in here, you can see it. You can look at the cross in that position. You can look back at the cross and see it as it is is happening you can see it as it's happening which means faith is still alive in this dimension there is no time it's a position in the spirit that can see what was past what is now and what is future that's why Jesus had to say his name I am the same yesterday today and forever he was trying to say I am in the core of time I am time I am who I am. And because of that, he was saying that I am the resurrection and the life. Although he wasn't resurrected yet when he said it, he was speaking from a position that was already receiving the benefits of his resurrection. Why? Because he was a witness to his own resurrection. He was a witness to him coming up out of the grave himself. So he could say, I am the resurrection and the life. Because he prophesied over that. He said in three days... I'm going to get back up. Oh, hallelujah. So he could say, I am the resurrection and the life. That's what he said to Martha. Right? So the key to that phrase is, I am. He moved into the spirit world, especially on this occasion, and he started to speak. Ah, many others have moved into that position as well, and they spoke from that area. Okay, here's something for us. Here's something for us. I, I try to get this out on the last time I spoke, and I, I think it, it didn't go across as I was trying to explain. But in Philippians, this, Philippians says this. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. Paul says this, that I might know him. And the power of his resurrection. That was the first thing he said. Then he said, which is the straight gate. The fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So what he's saying here, and it's important to keep it like it is, that order of reference is written like that for a reason. Now, the fellowship of his sufferings. He suffered in the garden. He suffered when they whipped him on the back, put the crown of thorns. He was on the cross. They were his sufferings. And sufferings meaning he was still alive. Right? He was still alive. That's why he was suffering. Paul says that I might know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. In other words, I want to be one. I want to be able to identify that what he went through, that was me. Paul said two years later, I am crucified with Christ. That was the answer to this, to this question. That I might know. Well, and then he found out a couple of years later, he found out, I am crucified with Christ, right? But here was the key. Paul said that I might know him. Holy Spirit says, say this now, that I might know the power of his resurrection. Aha! Before I go through the straight gate, I need to know this comforting word that I am going to get up at the end. Hallelujah. I need to know that at the end of the straight gate, I personally have a witness that I'm coming up out of my own grave. Amen. That's what I need to know. Jesus said that. He's the patent son. He said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Not only get up, but I'm going to continue to live with this resurrected life. So you and I need to know and have it squared away as a testimony, as something that's within us, that's been accounted to us, that when we go through the straight gate, we can endure the suffering with joy. And the joy is to know by revelation that I'm coming up at the end. Amen. 
That's the, that's the order of reference that I might know the power of his resurrection. It's a great thing to know. I will run through the straight gate. I will press through the narrow way because I have the confidence of the Holy Spirit. I'm coming up at the end. Amen. That's, that's what encourages me. And I'm going to go through the straight gate with joy. Just point me in the right direction through the word and I'm on. And I'm going through. Can you say amen? Uh -huh. So, that scripture reading for Matthew, uh, for the third day being raised again, was Matthew 17, verse 22 and 23. Jesus said, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. Amen? So he prophesied over his own resurrection. That's what we've got to do. We've got to walk in the understanding that I'm coming up at the end. Okay. So Lazarus, right? Lazarus and Jesus is talking about this area of Lazarus being sick, but his sickness was not unto death. His sickness was, death was not going to be the end of it. Jesus was pointing out that nothing is over until he says it's over. <laughs> death doesn't have a doesn't have the last say. In fact, de death doesn't have any say. Death will do what it's told by the Spirit of God. But Christ has the first and the last say. Any sickness, right? Listen to me now. Come into this day of atonement, not Passover and Pentecost, and we say, oh Lord, heal me. Oh God, heal me. No. God is moving you in a position of authority over your body and over the things that are in this earth. Right? And we need to know that any sickness that sentences you, sentences you to death has now lost its fear of death. It's now lost the fear and the spirit of death. Death has lost its authority of its certainty. In other words, death is not certainty. I've said this before, but death can't talk to you anymore. Death has no more fear over you anymore. You're not tormented by the word cancer. You're not tormented by coronavirus. You're not tormented by that. What you are in favor of is that this thing can't touch me. Amen? So that's important to, to understand that. So walking through the straight gate, the narrow way, once the believer begins that walk, and I put it like this, gets into the slipstream of the narrow way, sickness will not and cannot touch your body. It cannot touch your mind. It can't play around with your thoughts. Suicide is silenced in you. Nothing can talk to you. It is forever muted because of the journey that you're walking. All you hear is the voice of the blood. You hear the voice of the spirit. It's coming from your inner man, your spirit man. Why? How is this happening, Pastor Brian? Because you dare to go and start the journey of the day of atonement. You're starting to walk by faith in this feast. Amen? Can I say this, people of God? Whoever you are, ministries that are listening, wherever you are, people of God, saints of God, know this is the grace of God. You're going to move on from Passover to Pentecost. You're going to move on into the Feast of Tabernacles to finish your race, to run your course, to become a son of God, to become a son of a living God. It's not just going to happen by chance, right? There's no song, and I checked the song, Que sera, sera. There's no song here that says that. It's got to be specific. You've got to know in your heart that you're on this journey and you're on this journey with God. Every sickness that is not unto death to the believer that walks, it's not unto death to the believer that walks in this straight and narrow way. Trust the word. We're in a feast that diabetes will drop off. Heart problems, it'll cease. Cancer, relegated to nothing. Old age sickness, a thing of the past. You don't be tormented because, oh, you know, Pastor Brian, I've got this problem because I'm 70 odd and I'm 80 odd and I think I've got to accept this. That's rubbish. Your spirit man is eternal and your soul man is catching up to the spirit man of eternity. It's in you. Because we've been hearing the voice of the soul, the voice of the dust, too long. And he had his way with us.
too long. And we've been feeding off faith for our healing and our resources. We've been drip fed by Passover and Pentecost, not making light of it. But now he's given us the whole entire package. We are now full of the spirit of God of truth. And he's speaking to us directly. Old age sickness is a thing of the past. Obesity, gone. Dementia doesn't exist. All this stuff, we can lay claim to it because God is about to do unusual miracles in the house of God. Oh, what house of God? You! Inside of you. Any type of sickness, it has been paid for by the blood of the Lamb. He has put his stripes, the stripes were put on his back in order for the day of atonement to bring us through in our freedom. Can you risk an amen? amen? All right, let's just go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. I think I've got about 20 minutes before I close off here. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 25. And this is speaking about the woman with the issue of blood. Mark 5 and verse 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years, I'm reading out of the King James Version, and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, if I may but, may but touch his clothes. Other translations say, if I may but touch the hem of his garment. I shall be made whole. And straight away the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the, in the press and said, Who touched me? Or who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, Thou seest the multitudes thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said to her, Daughter, thy faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be thou whole of thy plague. Now, let me just say this. It starts off by saying, a certain woman. Let's just stop there for a minute. A certain, let's look at that word. A certain woman. When you see this word certain, and it speaks of this word certain in a number of passages in the Bible. You know, a certain man planted a vineyard. A certain man had two sons. A certain man was a ruler that came to Jesus. So when it says a certain man, he's giving, the Spirit of God is giving us room and flexibility for interpretation. All right? But because we're so specific now, that everything I read... If I choose to read it with the, uh, with the understanding that I'm standing in the Day of Atonement, that passage is going to talk to me about the Day of Atonement. So this woman, I've just put her in the Day of Atonement now. So whatever, she, whatever happens to her is coming because of the Day of Atonement, right? Now I used to preach this over here in Pentecost, and there's some good words that come out of Pentecost. But when you see it from the angle of the Day of Atonement, brother, it goes to another level. It takes you into the spirit of the church of Jesus Christ. So this certain woman gives me the ability to speak on part of the church because the woman speaks of the church. Let me be a bit more clear. The woman speaks of the church, but it speaks of the womb. Right? The womb, the womb man, the womb of a man. Who what man? The man Christ Jesus. This is his womb. The womb is the womb of the man Christ Jesus. So this area that this woman has found herself in the natural, push it up into the spirit, especially in the day of atonement, and you start to get another picture, another dimension of revelation of what is going on in the church in these last hours. So a certain woman, right, this womb, she was bleeding. So mainly she was bleeding from the womb. The church today is bleeding. We're coming into the greatest day where God's going to bring healing in the church because by his stripes I am healed. And we're talking about healing to the church. But there is hemorrhaging. There is bleeding. There is uncontrolled 
bleeding and loss of blood. It says that a certain woman which had an issue of blood, uh -huh, that she's bleeding. The church, as I've said, is bleeding. And I looked at this, and the Spirit of God has been talking to me a little bit about this. But you see, I know this is sensitive, what I'm going to say, but it's, it's reality. In the natural, when a woman bleeds, and she bleeds from that part of her womb, it's for a purpose. If everything was all right in her body, and she has her monthlies, and she bleeds at that time, there's a reason for that, physically, and that is to clean the womb. For obviously for marriage, for the impregnation of the seed from the man or the, or the husband. So the womb is clean, preparing itself for the, the seed. In the spirit, you can't have this type of bleeding because then there's no room for the impregnation of the word of the man-child, which was the purpose of the father. Uh-huh. So the spirit word cannot impregnate a church that is aborting the word because it doesn't understand how to get healed and get in position where Matthew 25 says that there was a virgin the five virgins that were wise went in but it, let me just read this as it comes now in Revelations 18 it's talking about trying to get a handle on the church in Passover and Pentecost concerning what's happening over in the day of atonement. You've got to get over here and get the eyes to see, ears to hear, to bring healing and restoration and to align the church with truth, prophetic truth of what's going inside her womb. How her womb is functioning. Because it has to function according to God's plan and pattern for the marriage and for the impreg impregnation for the conception, growth, and birth of the man-child. Are we hearing this? So Revelations chapter 18 says this. Listen to these words. I, I just want to bring our attention to it because a church that's being taught without the understanding, without the correct prophetic understanding will never bring the church to her healing. She will bleed. She will continually bleed. And I read here, in 23, it says, The light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. Right? He's talking about the church of Babylon, which is the woman. He says, And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. So the cry is finished. They can't hear it. It's not coming again. You see, right now, church, right now, God has put inside of you, right now, at this moment, the ability to hear the voice with inside you. But if you're all still mucking about over here in this realm and not moving across where the voice is to be spoken, he's not going to cry in Pentecost. He's going to cry out here in Tabernacles. That's where the voice is going to be made. But if you're still sitting in Pentecost, you won't hear him. That's what he's saying here. That the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall not be heard no more at all in you. You know why? Because the merchants were the great men of the earth and by their sorceries were all nations deceived. What are we talking about? A whole range of things? Well, what they're talking about is one thing, one covenant, one purpose, one word, and that's the prophetic word to put the conception, growth, and birth of the man-child in you. So this whole wall is all about getting the womb clean to be married to the bridegroom so that she can be impregnated with this word to bring the man child. That's what it's all about, people. But you've got to align yourself with understanding. And if the church doesn't quickly move across in its understanding in the Feast of Trumpets to get the understanding of the Day of Atonement, she will bleed and hemorrhage because she's receiving stuff that was never given to her by God. Now it says this, verse 24, And in her was found the blood of prophets, the blood of saints, and the blood of all that were slain upon the earth. The key word there is slain. The key word is slain. The prophets, the saints, and all were slain upon the earth. It says that in her was found the blood 
of the prophets. The blood of the prophets. What do prophets do? What do prophets do? They, they speak the prophetic word. And the main role for the prophets in this last move is to clean the church. Oh, what do you mean clean the church, pastor? Clean the womb with the prophetic word. The day of atonement is here to clean the womb by the prophetic word. God is releasing prophets into the church, into the womb to speak a word for her cleansing. That's the prophetic word. Revelations chapter 2 and 3 talks about the churches are going to be cleaned up by the prophetic word. Right? But here we find this woman is bleeding in the natural, but it has a significant truth and reality in the spirit concerning the state of the church. So it says the blood of the prophets. Let me go back. The prophets speak a prophetic word. And the prophetic word comes down to this prophetic word. To speak a word that will be conceived, that will grow and bring forth the man child. It'll clean to impregnate. But here, in her was found the blood of the prophets. What happened? There is a ministry in the earth that doesn't understand what it's doing that's been controlled by a religious spirit. Things that are happening within the church are aborting the prophetic word that was meant to clean and impregnate is now being aborted. The blood of the prophets, the blood of the saints, and the blood of all were slain. It means the prophetic word that was meant to clean you and to impregnate you with this word has now been aborted. The church is bleeding. And she's been bleeding too long. But I want to tell you, according to the word, God's going to deal with it. And the, the ones that are the main uh, offenders is the merchants, the great men of the earth. Who are these great men? Pastor Brian, the word, the word refers to them, the kings of the earth. Who are the kings of the earth? Well, according to Acts, according to Acts chapter 4, when Peter and John healed that man, and he got up and he was touched by God, and then the religious leaders carried on about it. And it says that in chapter 4, that they said, saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed... A noble miracle had been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And it says this, and we cannot deny it, but that it spread no further among the people. Let's, let's threaten them that they speak to no man in his name. So this is the religious leaders that are trying to stop what God is trying to do in the earth. Further down it says, and it names them, further down it says, so the kings of the earth, there they are, stood up and the rulers were gathered together against, against the Lord and against his Christ. So the kings of the earth, when you go to the book of Revelation, you'll find that the kings of the earth are those that speak this word, that carry influence in the church, that know nothing about those things of the spirit. That's why he calls them kings of the earth. It's kings of the soul, kings of carnality, kings of the dust, that speak out of the dust, the prophetic word, trying to interpret eschatology or the end times, but they have no prophetic understanding of what's going on, and yet they rule in these positions in the church, and you speak a lie, you speak false words that have no nothing to do with the true word of God. You are a king of the earth and you need to repent and come back to God to know the spirit of this word and not just the external expressions and what you feel might be the truth. Scripture's clear about this. Revelation 17 says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth, that's demons, the inhabitants of the earth are demons. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. See, it's all around the sexual area. It's because it's all around the impregnation of the bride. Huh? But she's going to be cleaned. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I got it in my spirit that she's out there in the wilderness. Uh-huh. Now, just get a balance on this. 
I am not saying Passover teaching is not from God. No, it has its rightful place. Pentecost is from God. It has its rightful place. I'm not saying anything about it. What I am saying, if you stay in Pentecost to try and interpret the prophetic word that was meant to come out of the Feast of Trumpets and the understanding, then it will lead you into the Day of Atonement. If you don't make the decision to come across, you're going to get caught in the loop. And it's a loop in the dust. And you'll never know what it is to speak on his behalf. So, if you continue speaking about end times and not know that you're speaking out of your own flesh, it's possible that you could become a king of the earth. A king of the earth is when the beast speaks out of his own nature. Now, Revelation chapter 13, it says that the beast was given a mouth to speak. You know what that means? The beast was given what? A mouth. A mouth that he would speak. The character is in us, but now God has, at this last move of God, has given the beastly character a mouth to speak. What does that mean, to give the beast a mouth to speak? This is what it means, that it has now the ability to impregnate the church with who it is. When it speaks, it speaks a word to impregnate. Its purpose is to impregnate. God, for some reason, had put it on, on hold. We call it the latent power of the soul. Latent means hidden. Power of the soul is still sitting in there. But at the end of the age, God is going to take the lid off so this beast can rise up with the mouth. So out of its character, it will speak for this one sole purpose to impregnate the woman, the church, like he did back in the garden. But it's not going to happen, people. It's not going to happen because the word already teaches how it's going to go down to those that are in the spirit. It's not going to happen. So I want to make it very clear that as we come into these areas that God is bringing us into, we're going to know that God is he's still on the throne. Amen? And so when we read these scriptures here, he's speaking about in the book of Revelations, chapter 18, that it says that, and chapter 17, it says this, so he carried him away in the spirit, where? In the spirit, right? Carried him away in the spirit into the wilderness. You know what the word wilderness means? In the spirit, according to the interpretation of this word, barrenness. Wilderness is not only a place without God, but it's a, it's a womb that is barren that cannot produce and cannot be impregnated with this word. God has to clean the womb that she might become a virgin and become fertile again for one reason, for the prophetic word of his own son. This character of the man-child can be put back in the church, in the womb. He said, I saw a woman sat upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten. I don't really want to go into that, but I'm just saying, making it clear. Blood speaks of the seed word of the prophets, the seed word of the saints, the seed word of all that was slain. The seed word was aborted by this ministry. Now, I know, I know that there's going to come ministries that will have to repent when they realize that what they've been teaching all these years, and I don't care how thick your notes are and how much backing and resources you put into it, listen, there's time to still repent and get back into the truth of these words. It's that simple. Get rid of it. Burn it. Chuck it out. Repent. Get the blood of Jesus on you. But the point is, get over here into this feast and begin to speak with authority of what God is telling you to do. Otherwise, you're trapped in your own soul. The soul has already had what it wants to say. Hey, don't be one that would have bought the word. The church that moves across into the Feast of Tabernacles gets an understanding with prophetic eyes through the trumpets is preparing herself for her bridegroom who is about to come. Amen? If she's a virgin, she's not bleeding. She's been prepared by Christ himself. And that's another teaching we can get into. So, We've only got a few more minutes, but let, let's, okay. Let's continue on in Mark 5. He says this. 
a certain woman, right, which had an issue of blood 12 years. Now, there must be a reason why it says 12 years. Well, there is. 12 is the number of divine government. When you read the book of Revelations, chapter 12, verse 1, talking about this same woman, but she's in now her glorified state. She is in now the full bloom of her being a bride, right? And it says that if you look at Revelations 12, uh, let me quickly grab it for you. Verse, verse 1, it says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, and her head a crown of what? Twelve stars. A crown of twelve stars. Twelve is the number of divine government. Stars, according to Revelation chapter 2 and 20, Jesus said, the stars represent messengers, right, of the church. They, they, uh, the stars means angels. Angels are messengers. Messengers carry a message, right? So to have this 12 stars, talking about the woman in Revelation 12, 1, right? It's a message. The bride is governed by the word of the mind of Christ. That's how she, she submitted to him. This is the bride. She's governed by the word of the mind of Christ, governed by the voice of the mercy seat, governed by the voice of the bridegroom. Amen? So when this certain woman came to Jesus and she was bleeding for 12 years, can I say this to you? In the spirit, this is a metaphor of the woman coming to meet her husband, her bridegroom, to be healed and made clean for the marriage. That's where she was going, in the spirit. Bleeding 12 years, recorded by the spirit of God to push it up into the realm of the spirit. She was about to meet her husband, her bridegroom, her soon coming marriage. She had to be cleaned and Jesus cleaned her and healed her for himself. Can you risk an amen? Ooh. I think I only got a few more minutes, but I just want to say this. Verse 26 says, And had suffered many things of many physicians, many soulish ministries. That's what she suffered trying to get healed. The church cannot get healed if that's the thing that's caused it. <laughs> Flesh and fleshy and soulish and carnal prophecies that talk about the church will only cause her to bleed. How can she go back to the to the the, the go back to the perpetrator and get healed when that's where it came from it came out of the soulish carnal prophetic ministries that don't have a clue about the prophetic word of the feast of trumpets to stop the bleeding of the womb it's gone back they're going back this is where it happened how can you get healed from something that's happened and it not only happens it perpetuates it keeps bleeding there's only one remedy. You've got to get the true prophetic word of God and know that he's there to heal you and clean you. It's only going to happen in the day of atonement, the place of healing, stepping into the day of atonement, stepping into the straight gate, the narrow way. That's where Jesus received the stripes on his back. When they ruptured his back, I want to tell you, it healed the church. It healed the woman. He was there for a purpose. And that was to bring that healing. Oh, he said here, had suffered many things of many physicians, she did. And she had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. I'm going to tell you, no soulish counseling or soulish word can heal the womb. It has to be by the Spirit. How much time, how much money, how much resources... How much energy have we put into a word that can never heal someone in the spirit as concerning the return of Christ? As I say, let me say it again, nothing wrong with Passover. It has its blessings, but it has its boundaries and its parameters of what that blessing would be. Same with Pentecost, lovely ministry, but it's only limited to what it was sent to do. The only way that we're going to be healed and perfected that sickness in the spirit 
will never return to us and be healed is through this Feast of the Day of Atonement. And only the understanding, the prophetic eyes that are given to us, not the beastly eyes, the prophetic eyes of the Spirit will only bring an internal change to the church. She bled internally. And it can only be healed internally by a word that's personal, internal, and intimate. So, the Bible says here, I'm almost done. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in to press behind and touched his garment. What does garment mean? Character. Oh, she pressed in to touch his character. To touch the character of Christ. She pressed in to touch. It was a touch of revelation. It was a touch of faith. Now let me give you this quick illustration. Because I try to put this illustration out as many times as I can. Uh, just a little testimony of my daughter, Nicole, when she was only about four, year, four years old. And she moved past me and she went into the room where her mother had just finished ironing. And she put the iron up and the iron was hot. I just happened to walk past at the same time and I saw her. And so I ran to her and I grabbed her by the hand because she was going like this up to the iron. She was going to touch the iron. I grabbed her and I said, Bernie, Bernie, hot, hot, don't touch now somehow, I'm looking at her, somehow in her mind, she believed me. I know that she believed what I said. So we went outside. Yeah, the next day, the next morning, we're doing our thing, moving around. Then I hear her crying in the same room. And I knew what happened. I ran in. She's standing there with this little burn mark, this little pink mark on her finger. She touched the iron. What's the purpose of me saying this? The day before... She believed me. When she touched the iron, she moved from believing to knowing. She knew it was hot. I didn't say it anymore. She knew. This woman said within herself, if I can but touch him. If I can touch him. I heard about him. I heard all the faith that talked about him. I heard the songs and I've heard everybody else's testimony. But if I can touch him, if I can touch him, I will move from believing into knowing that my God will heal me and that the church will be healed if the church rises up in one to reach out and touch him. That's what she said. If I can but touch his garment, touch his character. But she said, if I can touch his, but his clothes, I shall be made whole. Hallelujah. Wholeness is going to return to the church. When the ten lepers came to Jesus, he healed them. And as they went away, the Bible says, on their journey, they were being healed on their way back to the priest to give the final assessment and judgment that they were clean. They had to go back. So on their way, they found that they were healed of leprosy. Now you know the story that with leprosy, it eats the tips of your fingers, your nose, your ears. But one came back knowing that he was cleansed, came back and he worshipped the Lord. He came back and he said, I want to thank you, Lord. Jesus said, where were the other nine? He said, no, I don't know. But I've come to worship you and to thank you. And the Bible says that he turned around and when he went away, hallelujah, he was made whole. He had it all back. I want to tell you something. This feast of the Day of Atonement, people are beginning to get whole. Their body, their mind, all their physical faculties are coming back again. There's no such thing as this, lost my memory, or my intelligence is going, or I can't remember, I can't do this, my strength is abating. No, no. On this journey, we're going to walk and get healed, and it's coming back to perfection. Oh, it's a new day, people. It's a new day. Let me, let me close, let me finish here. Straight away, when she touched him, the fountain of her blood dried up. Oh, I wish I could preach about the dried up. Dried up is the same word when Jesus spoke to the fig tree. <laughs> the fig tree, that's where it all started back in Genesis. The fig tree, they clothed themselves with fig leaves. But he spoke to the roots of the fig tree and it dried up. It's the same word for drying up. When she touched him, it dried up from the roots. The law of sin and death is going to dry up. Amen. Oh, oh, the very source and the beginning of it. It all stands open and naked before God. 
and his word is going to go right in there into the very cellular level of our physical body and our soul is going to be healed from the very roots from the very beginnings God's going to go back into the root of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and burn and deal with the roots according to Malachi the fire went through the branches and the fire went down to the roots that's why the baptism of fire is going after the roots thank you Lord you dealt with the fruit Thank you, Lord, you cut the tree down. But now you're going after the roots. Hallelujah. Are you going to burn the roots? So it was dried up. She fell in the body that she was healed of that plague. She was healed of what? Healed of the plague. You know what the word plague means? The word plague, she was healed of the plague. Plague means to be whipped. It means to be scourged. It means to carry stripes. Ah! She was healed of the plague. Jesus, when he was whipped, he, he dealt with the plague. Oh, healing is in the blood. Hallelujah. The stripes and the whips only drew it out. It was the blood that healed. But the way it was pulled out of him by the whips gives us the understanding that the covenant of Isaiah that prophesied that by his stripes you were healed and when he was hit in the natural the blood released the prophetic word that you will be healed in the day of atonement you get healed you stay healed amen completely completely blessed by God here we go Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him that word virtue is a, is a, is a good word the word virtue and garment are very close, closely aligned, although it talks about the dunamis power, but it's aligned with the garment, which is the character. So when the virtue had gone out of him, his character was transferred from his body to her body. It was a character transfer. Come on, in the Day of Atonement, there's going to be a character transfer. The character of the man of sin and death is being removed and we're having the character of Christ. The bridegroom is going to transfer himself over into the bride and heal her and marry her. Amen. I'm a little bit fired up tonight. But oh, hallelujah. So that was transferred. It was transferred across to her. Remember, it says that she said in herself, if I can touch the hem of his garment, according to Numbers, that when the priests put on their garments they were told to sew a blue tassel on the four corners of their garment blue speaks of the anointing speaks of the holy spirit on the four corners of the earth so if you touch the blue if you touch the blue then all of you and all of creation will get healed he's a priest that walked the four corners of the earth amen even the line of tribe of Judah, the north, the south, the east, the west. When he walks, the whole earth is covered by him. North, south, east, and west. It is a sign of his dominion. Well, you know, in my Bible, when Jesus spoke, there's a lot of red. But if I could ink where the moving of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> this book would be fairly blue. It's all in the Holy Ghost. So his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging, and says, Who touched me? And he quote the woman, he said, Thy faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of the plague. I'm going to pull it up there because the plague is another word I wanted to expound on. But this is coming back to what we were saying about the stripes of Jesus. He bled, he sweat, changed the, the dirt, which gives me life. And now I'm stepping into this area of his blood by revelation that I will never get sick. I will never be touched of anything that's in the atmosphere. Once I get in the slipstream of this straight and narrow, nothing can touch my body or my soul. It's a done deal in God. And I want to encourage you. It's on its way. So let me finish. Jesus healed his bride from the soulish hemorrhaging of false prophetic words. When you prophesy out of the soul things concerning the end times, you are aborting the true interpretation of the prophetic word spoken out of the Feast of Trumpets. And that's according to Matthew 13, 10 to 17. Read it. Therefore, the woman, the church, is bleeding out of is, is bleeding out the true prophetic seed word of Christ that was 
to be spoken into her womb for the conception, growth, and birth of the man child. And that's what's happening. So, people of God, the Lord bless you and stay strong. And I just want you to know that with this, all this fear of this coronavirus that's going around, keep your eyes on the word. Don't keep absorbing what the television is saying. They are giving you certain instructions. Just take the instructions and live sensibly. But keep your focus in the word and the spirit of fear will not be transferred onto you. Mm -hmm. So do that and God will bless you. God bless you. Darkness is fading away.